and they're the people of the Clark County, Nevada. Who does the, the media says Bundy is going to stand over the federal government? Was Bundy out of standing over the federal government? Bundy was protesting the county sheriff. No. County sheriff protect my life, liberty, and property is what Bundy was saying. That's what everybody was coming to do is to, to, to get the government or give the get the sheriff to do his job. No. And of course the sheriff he went and hid under the table. <laughs> Did you see him under there? Anyway. back and I don't know how many of you is it the uh, uh, 2014 uh, uh, protest and he was up on the stage and he was all under the flags of the United States. Let me talk about the flags that was up under the 2014 protest. We had two flagpoles. One flagpole had we, and the other flagpole had we, the people, on it. That was on top of the flagpole. Underneath the flagpole, the first flag that flew on, on, on the pole, on one side, we did do both sides on one flagpole. The second flag, the flag underneath, we flew the people. What was that flag? Does anybody know what that flag was? Wasn't it the Nevada flag? Don't nope, tread on me. It wasn't Nevada flag. What was it? Don't me again. First. Nope. Yeah. Don't tread on me. It, no, it was the Clark County, Nevada flag. So so why is Clark County, Nevada sign their flag flying under We the People? Because we are the That's where you're at. They're the closest government to We the People. Mm -hmm. the, they're, the, they're the ones we really should play, be pledged to in, a, in a one sense. We shouldn't be pledged to a, a government that has very little power. We should pledge to the government that, that's closest to us. Uh, isn't that the government? that we elect, and isn't that the government that we elect, uh, uh, nominate and elect the county sheriff? Isn't that the government that we pay the county sheriff to protect our life, liberty, and property? Isn't that why we're here uh, under the flag protesting the sheriff to do his job? Because he represents, that first flag represents him, represents our closest government. And we're, we elected them and we pay them to do a duty. Now what's the next flag underneath that flag? Who knows? State flag. Okay, state it's the state of Nevada flag. We the people, the county, and the state of Nevada flag. We should be pledging allegiance to the Nevada flag. Why? Both of our state. Yeah, it's, it's a, it represents our sovereign state. It represents, you know, we're sovereign here. And, and the, the state has certain job or duties to do. Let's just say, like, what about a... Uh, a state highway coming down through there, don't you think it ought to have all the same 65 mile an hour speed limit? It should change every time you get to a new county. That's why we have a state government. Now what other, what's the flag underneath that flag? United States, United States. United States government. Why is it down on the bottom of the flagpole? Isn't, doesn't, isn't it always tradition, isn't it, that what we believe that it's supposed to be on top of the flagpole? And here Bundy has the my United States flag flying on the down half mask on the flag for what what the heck he trying to tell people? What is he trying to tell yeah, people? We're the between the states and the federal yeah, government. Yeah, we're government. saying that the federal government has we we, uh, we all pledge allegiance to this flag. We think it's beautiful. We know what it stands for. We don't want to degrade degrade it at all. But why is it on the bottom of the list here? Because it has very little power. It has a certain duties. Our Constitution gives it a certain duties to do. And we pledge that flag that it does that for us. We pledge that it represents our country and other nations. We pledge that it fights for our... our, our uh, the borders, protects the borders. Protects our borders. We, we're thankful for it, the protection. We pledge it because of those men that have died. We, we pledge it. There's been much blood shed for our freedoms and liberty, and we pretend we pledge it because it's supposed to protect our constitution. But I've just told you about the proper form of government. Where do we, the people, stand? At the top. On top. Not, not, we, not the federal government. This is what the government wants to do. When we go to this court down here, where does it put the government? Right up here with unlimited power. We have you better. You don't understand what it's like unless you, you spend 700 days in one of their prisons. 
you find out you stand up against the wall with your face towards that wall and you answer every question you want or they'll shove your face right into that wall. That's how they treat people. That's how they treat we the people. That's not the way we the people of America are going to be treated anymore. Yeah. 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 Nice roast beef for you, <laughs> and, a, and a good big slice of a good watermelon. Well, let, me, let me mention something. Then, well, namely, April 12th, 2018, four years anniversary, and it should be a gigantic celebration. Yeah. Well, the Marty yeah. 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 Well, I've been, Victory celebration. I, I found it ironic. I was thinking about this last night. One eight seventeen of the Constitution is what we are fighting for. <laughs> One eight eighteen is the day you were released. Isn't that a coincidence? I'm taking off my Bundy hat. As you notice, we opened with Clive and Bundy, that rascal in Nevada, that cowboy that was right. When he called for the militia, he had no idea that Daniel P. Love, the leader of the BLM thug army, the thug in chief, Daniel P. Love, had a written kill list. Kill this guy, kill Clinton Bundy, kill Amon Bundy, kill murder. Murder thee. He had a plan to murder. And we need to go in and find out who gave him that kill list. That's going to require a grand jury in Nevada to indict Daniel P. Love, bring him in and say, cough it up or else. I actually would prefer the or else or else would be better. But we need to find out. He had over 25 people on a written down listen, list to murder back in April of 2014 in the process of kicking the Bundys off their ranch, a family ranch that had been in that family for more than a century, going back to the 1870s. And the government moles under Obama put all kind of spurious information that wasn't true about them. But I'm celebrating with you. That's why I got my, my Bundy hat on here, Cliven. Uh, that was him in his home, in his ranch, near Bunkerville, near the I-15, where they had the showdown with the thug army of the thug BLM, President Trump, Donald. Sir, if you want to cut the budget and save us some tax money, just abolish the BLM altogether. Save one guy. Pick one schmuck from the BLM and let him be the director. Give him a non-air-conditioned office in Bunkerville and require him to sit in it eight hours a day, right through the summer, right through the winter. And he'll be the guy all the ranchers can go serve Notice that you're being sued. So the BLM can get sued, but also Daniel P. Love should be sued personally because even as a Bureau of Land Management thug officer that comes out to thug you, he had no jurisdiction to murder anybody. That was not in his job description. That's reserved for the CIA operatives and their band of thugs, sometimes the FBI guys. But that's not in the BLM uh, prerequisites for a BLM officer. Officer. There's a lot needs to be done, but the victory belongs to the Bundys. That righteous Mormon family, and I'm not Mormon, that stood their ground toe-to-toe -to -toe with the BLM, and when they saw they were going to be overwhelmed, they got on the horn and said, help, help. And that's when Eric Parker and Stuart and Loveline and uh, Jeremy Delamus and a whole bunch of guys, about a dozen, maybe two dozen, didn't stop at St. George and wait to see if somebody got shot. They went right down to the Bundy Ranch, settled in. The sheriff of Clark County came out, tried to get both sides to moderate, what the sheriff of Clark County should have done is what Cliven said. Disarm the BLM. They were federal. The federal were out of jurisdiction from day one. The federal 
is the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. Everything else is in the state's jurisdiction. Except, there is an exception, it's mentioned in the Constitution, for military bases like Air Force Base, Army Base, Navy ports, uh, Navy bases. That's federal jurisdiction as well. But all this grazing land is not federal. Cliven was right from the beginning. And by the way, a close friend of the Bundys tells me the Bundys didn't want a mistrial. Gloria, Gloria Navarro, as I like to say, Navarro in her kangaroo court. She's just, she's just a, a kangaroo hopping in and hopping out of that federal court doing what her puppet masters tell her to do. And I'll have more to say about that, but that's why I'm wearing my cowboy hat. Came into the studio with it. That's in celebration of the Bundy's complete, total victory. Now, because Cleveland refused to give any jurisdiction to this wet behind the ears, how did she get through law school? They let anybody get through law school. In Nevada, you can get anybody to pass the bar. That's how slummy the Bar Association has gotten. They've really sunk, and we need to get rid of them. And there's a guy, I guess, was supposed to be here today. His name is Richard Fine. He's an international attorney at one time, uh, very learned in the law, and he's got some very poignant views but because the 101 is closed due to mudslides, and we'll show you that in a little bit. But right now, I want to show you Cliven Bundy back at the Ventura Plaza in February 21 of 2015, almost three years ago, 35 months ago this coming next week. And Cliven was not yet arrested. He had been traveling free, and he very calmly explained what happened when the militia showed up. Let's roll it. This little guy was a Russian, and I'd known him for a few years. He worked for my neighbor a few years ago. And anyway, he came to stand. Very interesting, a real problem. And when they went forward, we the people went forward uh, against the federal bureaucrat's army and when we did that, and when I say we, I want to tell you, it's not me, it was them that went forward. And they went forward not knowing the militia was going to back them up. This was something that I didn't even realize for a couple of weeks after they didn't start having time to see the videos. Those people went forward, and they had very few arms. They wasn't armed. There was only maybe a half a dozen out of several hundred that had a, a sidearm or something on them. They went forward to defend our liberty and freedom and it wasn't going to let the, the feds have their way and they marched forward with the guns pointing at them and let me express this a little bit was anybody there that's here was anybody there it, it's sort of uh, interesting I, I, I go around and talk uh, and you know usually there's one or two that was there <laughs> so anyway and I always feel like they need to be the witness. I, I shouldn't be telling this story. They should tell it. It's their story. But let me tell you, they were going uh, to, towards these guns. And these, the, the feds were saying, halt, we have a court order, we'll fire. If you move forward, we'll fire. That, this was the language over their bullhorn. This is what they're telling the people. And the people kept them moving forward. And the people told me they did not have fear. Now, you know, you and I, it's sort of hard to understand. How can these people go without fear? It wasn't that they wasn't thinking about it, but they was going without telling you about one little, uh, little guy. This little guy was a Russian, and I'd known him for a few years. He worked for my neighbor a few years ago. <clears throat> and anyway, he came to stand with Bundy. And when they was under that bridge marching forward towards these guns, he took the American flag and headed out and headed, marched right in front of everybody. And my sons and other people, they kept a holler and come back. And finally, they were run and stopped him. And he said, remember, he's a little Russian guy. He said, I lived under this kind of a government 
and I'll be damned if I'm going to be in America and live under this kind of government. And he was going to be the first man killed. You know, what can you say? You, all, you just gain a lot of respect for that man. You start understanding where he come from, and you start understanding a little bit, well, we better be paying attention here. We better be fighting. We better be willing to stand and take that flag forward. I know you're here to learn about grand juries. And let me tell you, I don't know much about grand juries. I do know about we the people standing. And I have seen, let me just tell you a little, another little example of we the people standing. My son Ammon lives in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, you might have read this on the internet on the, uh, you know, as he started, he joined the, or tried to get airplane ticket, just like we did this morning. Well, he did that several times. And you know what he did? He challenges that. Every time they give him trouble, he puts that on the internet. And you know how many hits he'll get when he talks about the, uh, the federal government retaining him and causing him trouble like they did Buddha and I this morning, you know, he'll get up to a half a million hits on the social media. In less than 12 hours, 24 hours, he'll get a half a million. You know, we the people are paying attention to these problems. And you don't think a half a million people makes a difference? That's, that's how we the people, that's one of the way, that's, that's what brought the people to Bundy Ranch is the social media. But it was we the people that come. It wasn't Bundy fighting the federal government. Now it was we the people fighting the federal government. And guess what? The militia backed them up. Now let me tell you the story there. The, we the people and the horses and the men on foot and the women on feet, but going towards the, this army. I looked a little bit later in the videos, and here's militia in per perfect position up, to, up on that top of that freeway with a cement barrier rail along there pointing their gun through the cracks. Now those people, if the feds would have fired on we the people, that militia would have saved a lot of lives. And it might be the reason that the army or the federal army backed off because they could see that militia was there. Now let me talk to you a little bit about militia. Before this standoff, I never understood militia very much. It's a little bit like I don't quite understand grand jury. But let me tell you, it was very clear that, that we, the people, had the right to do what we're doing. But it was very clear that the strength comes from our Second Amendment rights. The militia was there to back up we, the people. That's something that needed to be done, and that's something that happened in, at Bundy Ranch. I don't know whether it ever's happened in, before in, for hundreds of years, but it did happen at Bundy Ranch. And let me talk to you a little bit about what's going on in Bundy Ranch now. In eight months, I have never seen a government licensed vehicle on my ranch, or even in that part of the county. I mean, talk about relief. Remember, it was just a few months ago, I had guns pointed at me. But now I haven't had one, uh, I haven't had a BLM, a Forest Service, Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, Federal, and nobody. And I haven't got no letter from the court. And I haven't got no letter from the sheriff. Uh, they, they have left me alone. Now, of course, you know, there are always kind of rumors that they're going to come and get me. They're going to do this and that. But you know what I tell them? When you got guts enough to do it, just come on. Because, you know, I had thousands of people there helping me. And now I know that I'll have 10,000s of people helping me next time. I want to talk, take just a little, one more minute here. When we the people was standing underneath them flags and the, my county sheriff was there, we met with the county sheriff. I wouldn't talk to the county sheriff until he met in front of we the people. And there was a mandate, mandate made to the sheriff. The mandate was take those arms away from those, those feds. Take those arms away from those federal agents. You know, a couple of days went by, and he didn't take them away. If he would have took them away, we wouldn't have faced them. They, those guns wouldn't have been poking down our throat. But the, but the sheriff didn't do what we, the people, asked him. And a few days later, I think two days later, I had this thought. The thought was sort of scary. My thought was, the good Lord has given America one more chance. 
There's 3,100 county uh, sheriffs in America. If they would all take care of their county and take those arms away in each county, uh, those arms would be taken away from the bureaucracy. I'm not talking about taking people's Second Amendment rights away. I'm take, talking about taking those government agency guns that they've, what's the word, issued. Government issued uh, arms away from those bureaucrats. When does a bureaucrat need a gun? What, why, what, why do they have all of these, you know, you hear all about all of these uh, ammo they're buying. That ammo's not to shoot foreign uh, enemy. They're to shoot we the people. And why do they need that arms? And why do they need that guns? You know, who's supposed to protect our life, liberty, and property? Who is supposed to protect our life, liberty, and property? Who do we hire? Who do we elect? And who do we hire? Our county sheriff's job. The only, he's the only man we hire and the only man we pay to protect our life, liberty, and property. Of course, he has a force, but we hire him. We elect him. And the feds don't have no jurisdiction and authority here. So what I'm telling you, America, we better wake up and we better take those guns away from those bureaucrats or we're going to have to face them in a civil war. Thank you. And if we get time, I'd like to ask it or answer any kind of question or anything. Do we have a question? Anybody got a question? Now's the time. This gentleman right here. said several months ago that an article appeared in the Federal Register declaring all the land, about 2 million acres around your property, as a national wilderness. If that wasn't enacted by Congress uh, by February 10th, it would stand by default. What's your position on that? What have you done about it? Well, I am, I am a, I, I'm, I understand it was an ACEC, which means a, a area of critical environmental concern. And they brought that ACEC over uh, about three counties, southern Nevada, which my ranch would have been in part of it. But let me tell you, they're putting another layer, another, let me talk to you just a little bit. But about, before then, they had ACECs in areas. And they had what they call, what they was doing here is they was saying, We'll give you access to the land. We'll give you like a byway. And you stay on the sidewalk and don't get off on the grass. And if you get off on the grass, we'll give you a four or $500 ticket. Well, the ACEC basically said, we're going to take the sidewalk away. So now you get on, you go anywhere, you're going to be on our land with this critical environmental uh, uh, concern. And now you're going to get a ticket for stopping along the road or picnicking or hunting or doing anything. So in other words, it was another layer. Thank you very much. That was Cliven Bundy. He was speaking there at an event that I and David Fee arranged at the Ventura Crown Plaza right on the Pacific Ocean Coast in Ventura County, California. That was, the date of that was February 21st, 2015. And he had been left alone for eight months. Now he still has to do what I suggested to do back then. You need to form your own grand jury in Clark County, and you could use some of those other 52 ranchers that were shoved off their land. Form your grand jury, indict Daniel P. Love, indict the FBI agents, indict the Metro SWAT team from Las Vegas that was also out there, indict all the people in the chain, including Gloria Navarro and the U.S. prosecutors, because they knew, they knew. They had 3,000, that's Gloria right there. The little, she looks like she failed to make the cheerleader list in a college cheerleader competition. She needs to be indicted. Harry Reid needs to be indicted. All these people, oh, and don't forget, Neil Cornsey. They all need to be indicted, all appointed under that Obama criminal administration by that non-president, illegal president, Barack Hussein Obama. That's what I said, an illegal president, Barack Hussein Obama. I don't care whether he's white or black or polka dot or has yellow stripes, you know, up his legs. I don't care. He was not born in Hawaii. And we have not been told the truth. And that's why Donald Trump pardoned Joe Arpaggio, the sheriff, who among other people 
over a half dozen groups independently analyze Barack Hussein Obama's birth certificate that he put on the White House official website and said, here it is, I was born in Hawaii. No, you weren't. And because of the background glitter in the things and the way they cut and pasted it, people were easily able to prove it was a fake birth certificate. He was born in Kenya, in Mombasa General Hospital. His mother was white, his father was black. And he grew up part-time in Indonesia. His mother then married an Indonesian man. So his stepfather was Indonesian, and then he got tied up with these communists in Chicago. And there was a plot, and, you know, and we haven't been told the truth about that. None of that concerned Clive and Bundy. But he stood up for we the people, so I'm gonna ask you to do something. I'm not asking you, like I did a couple months ago, to write to him in the CCA private prison, which ought to be closed down, but write to him in Bunkerville. And they know him. He's like a celebrated hero. Just write, Cliven Bundy, Bunkerville, Nevada, and send him a thank you very much for standing up against the federal thugs and letting everybody know they're out of their jurisdiction when they leave that 10 square miles we call District of Columbia, Washington, or Washington, D.C. That's the federal jurisdiction and the military basis. If you don't believe me, ask Kevin Michael, who's researched it along with other people endlessly. The problem is we give them jurisdictions. When you sign your get out of jail papers to be on house arrest, you agree, if you read the fine print, you agree that the court has jurisdiction. Don't give them jurisdiction. Cliven didn't. He could have been out of jail a month sooner. But he said, I will not sign that paper. That gives her jurisdiction. We owe a major applause to Cliven Bundy. Thank you, sir, for your service to all of the country. Now, the reason I don't have Richard Fine here today is because the highway's closed. And I want to show you a short clip here. We're going to roll this right now. Uh, where Montecito had mudslides. And there's nothing we can do. The 101 is closed. You're looking right there at a street. Now we have a, street. a wall of mud and water came down from the hills in Montecito, which is southern Santa Barbara County. Huge rocks. Uh, they said it was just uh, rolling at about 40 to 50 miles an hour. The water and mud was rolling. It took out uh, utility poles. Three large uh, expensive homes were completely washed off of their foundations and just crumbled up. They have rescued a girl and a woman uh, from the debris field. I'm Brisa Fang, so she's not kidding, folks. Take a look at this video. This was texted yeah. to me by Joyce Dudley, our district attorney for Santa Barbara County. This is uh, in between Summerlin, Montecito, not exactly sure where, but that's the northbound lanes of the 101. It's just covered in mud. There's about a foot of it there, and uh, the, uh, the underpass as well, that little creek bed there full of water, uh, just a, a huge mess that may take, if not today, it may take even into tomorrow to clean up. Who knows? We're just not sure, but this shows us just how much heavy mud and debris has come down, and it's completely blocked the northbound lanes. And as Babrisa mentioned, people are now trying to go northbound on the southbound lanes, which is a horrible idea. You just don't want to put yourself in that situation. There are a lot of emergency crews trying to get in and around this area, people who may be stuck in mud that's in Montecito. And you know, that uh, it's not just the mud we're worried about coming down boulders. You know, we saw John Palminteri, giant rocks coming down. I mean, this we're talking about this uh, mud flow is 50 miles an hour sometimes. So uh, as you're seeing right now from John's live shot right here, um, and they're trying to get them out of the roads, but just absolutely huge. And, you know, you don't want to be in the way when those rocks come down. Yeah, this is Hot Springs Road in Montecito. It doesn't even look like what we would normally think of it as. It's completely blocked by these large rocks. Enormous trees have collapsed along the sides. Power lines are everywhere. This is what it looks like to the people with cameras on the scene in southern Santa Barbara County. Uh, those those rocks you're looking at right there, some of those rocks were a half a mile away up in the hills. They said it took about 15 minutes uh, for the mudslide to cover two miles from where the place had been burned out 
several weeks ago. Darkness shrouded all this this morning, but now as the sun is coming up or the skies are lightening up and the storm is breaking up, you can see how the homes that were here are completely gone from their foundation, missing, broken up, and destroyed uh, in every way you can think. Uh, because we have power lines over here, trees down over here, cars twisted up, and uh, some of the structural integrity of the homes can't even be identified except for a concrete pad, and that's it. Everything else is just sheets of wood or splinters of wood that uh, are piled up on top. We see a roof uh, surface over there. We see solar panels, and within that, you see a lot of yellow emergency jackets and employees are there. Uh, looking underneath for possible victims. We have multiple reports of unaccounted for people in this area. And uh, the fire department says they have made some tremendous rescues with the urban search and rescue teams, uh, the water rescue teams. We saw them bring out a teenage girl earlier, uh, and it looked to be an extremely tragic situation. But we understand she was breathing and survived, and that's a, a blessing at the base of this uh, tragedy. Also, a uh, two or three year old was found in the mud with no one around to that child. The baby was rescued by the uh, search and rescue teams and uh, brought uh, to safety. In the far part of the screen, I see a dog that was white. Now it's coated with mud. It's one of the search dogs there. And uh, it's looking for anyone who might be trapped or uh, alive and underneath uh, one of the structures or vehicles or debris of which there's plenty of it could be uh, injured or twisted up in there and uh, that dog is trained to find some. You can see utility poles in the middle of the street before wrecking crews were pulling it out. Uh, they're still pulling people out of the degree against that that building that's been moved off its foundation. You can see the level where the mud hit the wall. Uh, this area doesn't look at all like it did 24 hours ago. Uh, it was a scary thing. People were caught at 3.30 and 4 in the morning in their homes uh, with their homes simply moving off the foundations. We haven't got uh, the reports of the missing yet, but there are people missing who were living in those homes and we're still trying to find out where they are, if they're even alive. Uh, but it's hard to move those boulders to look for bodies, but this, this is the way the street looks. Uh, where houses used to be, they're gone. It's just amazing to see all this mud and these rocks that moved two miles from the hills that were burned out last week. But as for those of you worrying about Neverland, I was just out to Neverland. Neverland is fine. It's not affected. Uh, the gates are there. But I would recommend to any Michael Jackson fans planning to come up, don't. You can't get to Neverland uh, without going through Route 166 and down 5 and coming in through Santa Maria. Do not try to come up from Los Angeles uh, this week. It's going to be a mess. So be cleaning this up for a week or more. That's all I can say right now. It's really bad. I'm just checking my mic for everything. And here comes uh, another helicopter. Oh, you can't hear me. Okay, I just didn't, I didn't hear you. I'm just gonna start this over again. I'm on Olive Mill Road, and the sheriffs have just come to take the remains of someone who died in this disaster away. We're in Montecito, and there's a sheriff's helicopter flying overhead, and there is so much flooding and debris. I'm gonna see if Ryder can just show you a little bit this way. Ryder, can you follow me over this way? So we're right by the Montecito Del Mar. We're on the, uh, it's a private drive. If you look this way, this is the debris flow that is blocking the train traffic. And now people can't get by train, they can't get through the 101, and a lot of people are here trapped in their homes without power. Um, this debris flow includes some really uh, bizarre things. It looks like there are mattresses, there is a surfboard, there is patio furniture, there are ladders. Um, you know, it is just hard to believe. I'm not even sure what that container looks like, but that. That came a long way down the street. And then I'll just let you look back this way. There are people with the, with the trains, you can hear. No train is traveling down these tracks. The 101 uh, is closed. Uh, that military vehicle, as she said, is here.
to take out a dead body because nobody else can get a vehicle close enough to pull a dead body out of the debris. We don't yet know how many people died in their homes at 334 when that wall of mud and water came down uh, the overflowing creek as a result of all the fire burning the vegetation that was holding the mud and land rocks. It's a mess. Indeed, it's a mess, and now the death count is up to at least 15 people, 20 people missing. And last night, uh, 300 people were trapped up on the hills in their neighborhood with no electricity, no running water, no gas. And there's a group of people are beginning to suspect that a natural gas line broke somewhere up in the hills. And when it broke, the gas leaked and ignited, set a house uh, full of gas, which exploded. The explosion then rocked the hills and sent that liquefaction of the heavily saturated mud, freshly burned from the fire, sliding down the mountains two miles from that scene you just saw. And once it got going, it just picked up more rocks and more debris and crushed houses and wiped out roads and took out walls that people had put in, uh, you know, to keep strangers off their property. Just took it all out and it just all came down the hill. 300 people isolated last night. Uh, I think by tonight they'll have that down to a probably 150 or less. So that's why we don't have Richard Fine. If you want to be in the studio when we have Richard Fine here next Wednesday, today's the 10th of January, 2018, on the 17th of January, next Wednesday, we will have the lauded and esteemed internationally recognized attorney, Richard Fine, here, live in the studio. And he has a solution. I think a lot of we the people will be able to relate to. If you want to be down here, we have five seats available yet. Just give me a call at 805-928-1100. 928-1100. And give me your number and tell me you want to be here in the studio, in the studio audience here when Richard Fine is here next Wednesday. Would have been here today except the one was closed and I just showed you the tape of why it's closed and Richard was fine with that because neither one of us wanted to do a 300 mile detour to get him from where he is down in Ventura County now up here to Santa Barbara County. Now I want to give you an interview uh, and a document that you probably haven't seen. This is Richard Fine where he received an award quite some time ago down in Orange County for his standing up for the rights of the people against an abusive, malicious, capricious, and criminal judiciary that is now nationwide in America. Here we go, Richard Fine. Yeah, we're here last night, you know that I'm 73 years old. So I decided that in giving this particular talk today, I was going to leave you with certain things to do. Now, the, my problem became the following. Given my age, I wasn't so sure that since I'm going to be speaking for a period of time, whether I should give you the suggestions at the beginning or the end. Because I wasn't sure if I could remember them by the time I got to the end of the speech. So. I'm going to give you the suggestions at the beginning. That way, if I forget them, you'll have them. And then, I'm going to go, it's sort of like a, a back type of thing. We start out at the beginning as to what can be done, and then I'll go through everything that will end up with that. Now, these are the suggestions out of the straight come on cold. First of all, many of you may or may not know that 90% of the judges in California receive illegal payments from counties. Surprise? Yes or no? No. no. 
No means that you aren't surprised. <laughs> no means that you didn't know. No means Not you didn't surprised. Know. Not surprised. How many of you didn't know? Most of the room. Okay. What happened was this. Starting in the mid-1980s, what occurred is, and I believe it started in Los Angeles County, Los Angeles County decided that it was going to pay the judges extra money. And the reason that they gave is they said that we want to attract and retain qualified judges to serve in Los Angeles County. That sounds very nice. There's a problem. The problem is, is that the judges are state elected <coughs> constitutional officials. In other words, they don't work for Los Angeles County. They work for you. They work for the state. And if you look on your ballots, you'll see that you elect the Superior Court judges. So if L.A. County gives the judges money to attract them, they can't. Because you can't attract someone who has to run for an election. And if they give them money to retain them, they can't do that either. Because they have to run for re-election. What does the money come down to? A bribe. Straightforward and simple. Now I'll get into all of that later on. Here is the solution to get rid of that problem. You're a political group. I'm making the following suggestion. What you do is you go to your county board of supervisors, and there are 29, actually 30 counties that pay, make these payments. Go to your county board of supervisors and you say, stop the payments. Because whose money are they taking? They're taking money out of the general fund. But where does that money come from? That comes from your property taxes. So you're not only paying for these judges through your state taxes, they're now taking your property taxes and they're paid for the judges. So you go to the Board of Supervisors and you say, we want you to stop paying the money. Number one, you cut off the water. Number two, you go to them and you say, we want you to pass an ordinance that says any judge who received money from the county can't sit in the court for this county. Now, if they're an elected state judge, they may be able to sit somewhere else, but they can't sit in the county here. Real simple. Two real simple things. Courts don't get involved. Judges are screwed. <laughs> One, they don't get the money. Number two, they can't sit in the county because they got the money. I'm going to go into a lot of other things later on. Those are the two real simple things. And how do you get it accomplished? You put the pressure on the supervisors. And how do you put the pressure on the supervisors? Because of the fact that you elect them. And how do you do that? Because you can get out there and you can campaign. campaign against them. You can go in and show how much money they have paid out to these people. And you can go in and say, why do you want to re-elect a supervisor that has paid all this money out? Which was illegal. I'll get into that later. Okay, got that out. Now, let's go into who am I? Okay. I'm a 73-year-old kid that was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and got lucky. I went to the University of Wisconsin undergrad. I then got lucky and got into the University of Chicago Law School. Now, as my daughter put it, I went to law school before Christ was born. <laughs> <laughs> Started out in 1961, graduated in 1964. That was an altogether different era. In 1964, as I was on my way into Naval Jag, the, uh, I got lucky again. And I got into the London School of Economics. And I was going to go there 
to do a master's in law with dissertation. My dissertation was going to be on common market antitrust law. The dissertation got long, and the school said to me, well, if you stay around another year, you can get a PhD. It wasn't quite that simple, but that's sort of the short end of the story. 1967, I was awarded a PhD in the subject of law, international law, and my thesis now became international and comparative law, antitrust law, or how to screw the other guy in 14 ways in international business. <laughs> <laughs> to do that, I had to survey all the antitrust laws of the world and then come up with a treaty. Did that. Now it was time to go to work. So there were two jobs that were open to me that I was interested in. One was with the United Nations, and the second one was to do antitrust work for the United States government. Well, the UN job that they offered me was in human rights. At that time, the son of the Aga Khan was handling human rights for the United Nations. You knew they weren't doing anything. The United States government job was very, very interesting because I would then be chasing international cartels. They interviewed me in Paris, and the only reason I got the job, as I put it, is I was the only one that could order breakfast. So if they wanted to eat breakfast, they had to hire me. They ate breakfast, I got hired. Now, during this period of time, while I was doing these things, I also, being a poor kid out of Milwaukee, ended up getting a certificate of comparative law from the International University in Luxembourg, uh, three certificates of comparative law, and a higher diploma of comparative law from the International Faculty for the of Comparative Law in Strasbourg. And I traveled to every country in Europe with the exception of Romania, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia. This meant in 1966 I was in Poland, I was in Czechoslovakia, I was in Hungary, and I was in Russia. Now, uh, they had a little thing back then called the Iron Curtain. So, when it came time, and I was going into the Foreign Commerce section of the Antitrust Division, which meant that I had to have a certain type of security clearance. It took the FBI and the CIA one year to go through and check everything out. In fact, it's a humorous aspect. Close to the end of the year, I called the CIA in London. So they had an office there and call it say CIA. That's the CIA. I said, I'm, you know, I'm Richard Fine, you're supposed to be checking me out. What's taking so long? The guy says, Oh, we did it already, you know, we're finished. You know, I mean that's sort of a little bit loose back then. And anyway, they called me and I, I went to work for an international law firm during the time that they were checking me out. Because I told the head of the international law firm, I said, Well, Peter, you can hire me or I can wash dishes. He said, Well, we can't have you doing that, so we'll hire you. So I did all this international law work for a year. Government called me in the beginning of October of 1968, and they said, you have a week to get to Washington. Otherwise, you're going to lose a job. So I said goodbye to the law firm and went to Washington. And I started out in the Foreign Commerce Section, the Antitrust Division. First job that I had done, I'm 28 years old. Very first job that I have is to investigate the international pulp paper and newsprint cartel. Now this was a cartel that existed across the world, and what they do is they would meet in various places, and they set the price for pulp paper and newsprint, and then based upon the world price, they would then, you know, that would then reflect the United States price. And at 28 years old, I had the sheer joy of going through and fighting every major Wall Street firm. And the man who was the Attorney General under Eisenhower, came down to negotiate a subpoena with me. I was so excited I called home. Because you know, the Attorney General was coming down you know, to negotiate a subpoena. So that was the start of my career. Uh, we recommended an indictment. It went up to the White House. Nixon nixed it. And uh, that was the end of that indictment. I was pissed off. They then gave me a choice to go after the National Football League you know, or General Motors and Ford. Now, take a look at me. Take a look at a football player. <laughs> you know I'm not going after a football player. <laughs> GM and Ford are just a couple of big corporations. Went after them. We indicted them. This time around, we got smart. We took the indictment, put it in a lockbox, and told the White House, here's the deal. <laughs> you guys try and stop this one 
we let the grand jury run and we go out to the press. Jim and Ford got indicted. So after four years, you know, I left the Justice Department and I was offered a job with a firm out in California. And they shipped me out to California. I ended up working for them for a year and a, the head of another firm in California that had offered me a job came to me and said, look, Sam Yorty's uh, been defeated for mayor. Tom Bradley has become the mayor. Uh, there's been some problems with corruption in the Yorty administration. Uh, the guy that's handling the investigation is good, but uh, he's lacking a certain amount of, shall we say, guts. Or not necessarily guts, but knowledge as to how to go in and really dig this stuff out. We want you to come in and become a special counsel of the Governmental Efficiency Committee and nail these guys. So I came into the city government and became a special counsel. We knocked off Yorty and some of his friends. And at the same time, I founded the first municipal antitrust division in the country. And I did that you know, for a year. And then after that, 1974, opened up my own practice. And I started out a little office, 11 feet by 13 feet. And I hired a secretary. And the secretary and I bought her an IBM Selectric. Remember the IBM Selectric? The secretary said, if you don't have work for me, you know, I'm not working to cost you anything. Anyway, uh, things went along, and some of the lawsuits that I got involved in was one of them, when you get to United Way, you designate where you want your money to go. That's because of the lawsuit that I brought. The man against me was Richard Reardon. <laughs> one thirty in the morning, the day that we were going after the preliminary injunction, we settled the lawsuit, and that changed the entire way that United Way worked. And before that point in time, you gave to United Way, and they decided where your money went. After that, that was 1979. After that point in time, you could give to United Way, you could tell them where you wanted the money to go. What United Way had done is that there was another organization called Associated Intro Donors. They ultimately merged with United Way. And what happened is that United Way told all the charities that if they gave if they took money from associated in-group donors, United Way wouldn't give them any money. A little anti-competitive. Mm -hmm. I was hired by AID to go after United Way, and that's how we nailed them. And that's how the whole charitable thing changed. Another lawsuit that I brought was a lawsuit against OPEC. Because it turned out that this is, remember in 1979 when, all the, when the gas prices first went up? Yeah. Yeah, well, a group called the International Association of Machinists, who was the union for all the aircraft industry, got ticked off. You can find that on YouTube. If you want to watch it again, uh, this attorney is not your average attorney, obviously. He's got three law degrees. Uh, he's worked for the top people in government. Nevertheless, when he caught the Los Angeles judges, and I mean all 400 and whatnot of them, taking bribes, open bribes, he called them on the carpet. You won't want to miss next week's live show at this time, Wednesday, from noon to 1.30. If you want a seat, give me a call, 928-1100, and we'll reserve one of the remaining five seats live in the live audience here at the television studio. Now, there's a part two to this, there's a part three and a part four. Part five, I think it was, got so controversial, Google removed it. But we can show you a little bit of part two. And after that, we're going to go to the Tea Party production. And I think you'll enjoy this. Here's part two, Richard Fine, telling it like it is. And because their, their members are going to lose jobs. So anyway, they brought me on to take on the OPEC nations, OPEC and the OPEC nations. And I brought that particular lawsuit. And I traced the price fixing, because OPEC's price fixing is out in the open. They meet in Vienna, they sit down, they decide how much you're going to charge for a barrel of oil, and then that gets charged to the distributors, which are the American companies, which then comes all the way down into your gas pump. And I was able to trace that. And 
The United States uh, gives tax credits and everything to the companies, and we're able to trace the whole thing, actually through their annual reports, because they report all that. So we went out, pseudo -pair. Who's on the other side? None other than Antonin Scalia, now judge on the Supreme Court. Well, we were in the, uh, we were in front of Andy Howler, who was a U.S. <coughs> District Court judge. And this is sort of a side story, but it's a little bit interesting. Andy wanted to go on vacation. So we were trying the case from 9 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. During the case, while the case was going on, Andy went back to Washington for a judge's convention. Well, Andy was a very honest guy. Came back, and he said that he met with Attorney General Griffin Bell. This is under Carter. And Andy gives the following story. He said he met the Attorney General, and he said, Mr. Attorney General, and the Attorney General says, oh, call me Griff. And then he says, Griff says to me, well, what's happening with this OPEC case? And he says, what? He says, you know, the OPEC case that you have in front of you. Anyway, a little bit of pressure was being put on Andy. The end result is that Andy decides that the OPEC nations were really fixing their tax rates, so therefore they weren't really price fixing. So he stuck it to me. We go up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit decides, no, it's a price fix, but they're going to use the act of state doctrine because it's a political question, and the courts are not going to get involved in a political question. So based upon that reasoning, that's why OPEC is managing to exist. Now, years later, through one of the organizations, a friend of mine came to me and said, well, he said, Richard, I don't know if the story is true, but a friend of mine who was in the Carter White House told me the following story. He said, I can't tell you if it's true or not because it's coming to me third hand. He said, this guy told me that King Saul called Carter and said, get rid of that case or Saudi Arabia is going to pull all their money out of the United States. I sort of prefer to believe the second story because if you look at the court decisions, it's one thing. If you look at the reality of life, it's a second thing. So OPEC was another case. Another one that comes down the line is that I had done a couple of cases in the U.S. Supreme Court as amicus briefs on antitrust and things. And my client in those particular cases came to me one day and they said, Richard, the state's taking all of our money. Now this was the California State Electronics Association. These are the repair people that go in and do all your warranty repair to the independent repair people, the little shops that you see for uh, that fix your computers, that fix your appliances, and all these other things. And I said, what do you mean the state's taking all your money? They said, well, we put money into a fund that takes care of consumers. And I said, so? They said, well, the fund's gone. I said, what do you mean the fund is gone? They said, the fund is gone. I said, well, how did the fund go? They said, in the budget, the state took all the money out of our fund. I said, really? He said, no. So I took a look, and sure enough, they did that. Not only did they do it with their fund, they did it with 49 other funds. So we brought a lawsuit, because you know, that's illegal. Can't do it. And we won. Then we brought about 10 other lawsuits. We won those. And we won so many lawsuits that in the end, I ended up returning and saving for the California taxpayers approximately a billion dollars. The financial director of the state finally told the legislature, look, you keep doing this, we're going to call Richard, he's going to sue you, and, you're going to get the, and we're going to get the money back. So they stopped doing that. They then passed a law saying that the legislature could borrow the money, but had to pay it back. So that's where that one ended up. So that became you know, some of the things, those are some of the suits that came down the line. And with the CSEA, I changed the entire way. I sued all the manufacturers of consumer electronics, of uh, appliances and everything, and change the entire way that servicing is done in California because the Attorney General wasn't enforcing that law. So those are some of the things that brought me along. Now we get into, how did I get into all the trouble? 
<laughs> One day, someone I ended up uh, being called by Lakeos, which is the union that represents the people that do the inspections for restaurants, swimming pools, and all these other things. And they had brought a lawsuit against the county of Los Angeles with respect to money that the county was taking for these inspection fees and putting it in their general fund. And the lawyer that they had, you know, just basically they thought this wasn't sophisticated enough to be able to try this lawsuit. So they called me. And I got into the lawsuit. And we went to trial. And the end result was the county was taking $45 million a year out of these inspection fees. State law says that the inspection fees are supposed to be segregated into a special fund. The county wasn't doing that. So we went to trial, won the trial, and ended up taking the 40, they had $11 million left that year. We took the $11 million, we got a judgment establishing a special fund. We froze all the inspection fees until that $11 million was gone. All the new money went into the special fund. Well, when it came time to get paid, the judge refused to pay me. He said that it was bad for unions, county unions, to sue the county. I ran that up through uh, you know, the courts and everything, got nowhere. And <coughs> then that took place, that was 1999. Now, previously, boy, I forgot one to sue Go back. Big one. In 1997, you know, remember we had all these budget crises in California? You know, they used to go for 90 days and there's no budget, mm -hmm. and small business, small and minority business owners are going broke. They aren't paying the county welfare money and everything else. In the meantime, what are our good politicians doing? They're getting paid to sit up in Sacramento and fight with each other. And they're taking their per diem, they're taking their salary, and the governor's taking his per diem, his salary, and everything else. And we, the people, are getting stuck. 1997, I brought a lawsuit, and it, it went, no, basically, it got denied, and on a demur and everything, I put it up in appeal. 1998, same thing happens, I bring the lawsuit again. This time, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association joined in. We went in, and... Believe it or not, we got an injunction. Closed down the government. Literally. Got a Judge O'Brien, he went in, ordered the government closed down. Next day, they passed a $19 billion emergency bill <coughs> to keep things going. But the suit kept going up. Now, that stopped everyone's salaries, including the judges. Pissed off. The, uh, <laughs> sort of a little side note, we had a trip planned for our family to go to Paris. I had accumulated a lot of uh, American Express points. We were scheduled to go to Europe for 28 days. So my, on the points. So my daughter and I got on the, my wife, daughter, myself, my daughter and I were singing, we're leaving on a jet plane. <laughs> and, you know, if government closes down, we got the hell out of the country. <laughs> Well, that's Richard Fine. He'll be here live in the studio. Call me, 928-1100-1100. If you want to be in our live studio production next Wednesday at 12 noon here in Santa Maria, California, Richard Fine, the esteemed attorney, internationally known, hot on the trail of judicial corruption. He'll be here live in the studio, and you can talk to him after we finish the production live. Now, we're going to take you to something I didn't produce, but I like it. I think you will, too. And don't forget to write Clive and Bundy, Bunkerville, Nevada. Thank you for standing up and putting the federal thugs back in their jurisdiction to that 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. and the military bases. Thanks for kicking them off the land. They didn't belong there. The Bundy and the other 52 ranchers belong there and encourage them to form a grand jury in Clark County and go after those federal thugs. Here we go. Thanks for watching today.
The results in the midterm election were extraordinary, but that means we have momentum and we have to take advantage of that momentum. Tea Party Patriots is not finished now that the election is over. Our work is just beginning. Can you hear us now? Recently, Jenny Beth and I returned from a 20 state 30 city tour. The purpose was really to get out there in the field. We are promoting our core values, talking to people about what liberty means and what the Constitution says. People around this country overwhelmingly agree with our core values. Physical responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. People around this country want Tea Party Patriots to help them hold politicians accountable. If the people that we are voting for do get elected, we're happy, but we have to hold these people's feet to the fire. We have to make sure that they listen to the people. We've all been asleep at the wheel. That always ends up like a wreck. We're looking for honest men and women who are going to take us back underneath the Constitution. The Congressional Accountability Project is one where we're going to have a perpetual legislative watch. We're going to make sure that the people who are elected to Congress do uphold our core values and uphold the Constitution. The Accountability Project will watch what the congressional members are doing, watch how they're voting. When it seems that they're about to cave on a vote, we'll turn the pressure up and turn the heat on so that they, they stick to our core values. We'll give them the political backing and the political cover they need so they can go to their leadership and say, this is not what my constituents want, this is not why I was voted in here. In order to fully execute on the Congressional Accountability Project, we need technology resources. We need to be able to track legislation in real time so people in their home districts can follow that legislation and apply appropriate pressure. We need the tech we need the technology to enable us to communicate on a regular basis with our local coordinators. We can get the message out. We want to work to give our members and our supporters the tools necessary to empower them to start their own Tea Party groups and to continue to spread the message. You can't do that on a shoestring budget. And you can't just sell t-shirts locally, which was what we were doing. You're going to need funding to be able to go in and push resources. Do they have sufficient funds to be able to uh, go out and bring in more people and get ads into newspapers nearby? We want to do a national convention next year and regional and state conventions for people who maybe cannot make it to a national convention. We need coordinators in from all over the country so they can sit face to face with these folks, look in the whites of their eyes, tell them what's expected of them back home. We also need to have a television, radio, and internet campaign where we're working to educate ordinary Americans about what Tea Party Patriots stands for. Really, in the scheme of things, we're not asking for a lot. When we talk about the federal budget, we're talking in trillions of dollars right now. In order to make sure we cut that budget to reasonable levels, we're looking to raise $10 million in 2011. If we don't get folks helping us with the resources, we can't keep our eye on the ball, and we can't keep these people accountable. Tea Party patriots across the country are demanding the repeal of Obamacare. We want the new Congress to work to balance the budget. The out of control deficit spending we've seen over the last several years cannot continue. They want to see lowered spending and they want to see a return to constitutional principles. Our children and grandchildren deserve a better America and we expect this Congress to work to give them that better America. Today, we are planting our flags in the Capitol grounds. We hereby reclaim the Capitol for we, the people of the United States of America. If we just think that casting our votes is the end of the process, we're going to lose. I mean, that is literally failure. We've done that before. We know what it leads to. We're experiencing the results now. It's imperative that we stay engaged in the process. The left and the progressive agenda has been very good at using grassroots organizations like MoveOn.org and Organizing for America to mobilize and motivate their grassroots supporters. It's time to stand up and do the same thing that the left has done, and not just to do it as well, but to do it even better. People really want our core values to become a reality in America. We've been out in the field, the groups are growing, and they need our help with resources to continue that growth. The November 2nd elections were only the beginning of our quest to restore our nation. And if we fail to build on the momentum that we work so hard to create, then our liberty and our nation are at peril. 
That's why I ask you to dig down deep and donate the most generous gift you can afford to send to Tea Party Patriots today. Every Patriot can make a difference. So please help us with the donation of $25, $50, $100 or more to ensure that the Congressional Accountability Project is a success. Thank you. I am the Tea Party Leader. I am the Tea Party Leader. I am the Tea Party Leader. You heard that message. That was from 2010. We're now eight years later. They were talking about budgets for 2011. Nobody saw Donald Trump coming. Isn't that amazing? Nobody realized Donald Trump was in our future. Even though over the last 40 years, he had mentioned several times he planned on doing something Someday, he might consider running for president. If things had to get so bad that we had an illegal president, imagine that. An illegal president not born in America. And our Constitution clearly indicates not only must the president be born in America, his parents must both be U.S. citizens at the time he is born. What happened? The Democratic Party, as a machine, was controlled by the bank gangsters from the top, just as most of the Republican machine is. That's why Donald Trump had to fight through the swamp of the Republican upper echelons to get his day in the sun, to even get in the debates. But amazingly, Trump did it, and I didn't even vote for him. So if you're a Democrat, you can't blame me. I didn't even vote because you Democrats of this county in Santa Barbara and this state of California had gotten so accustomed to stealing the elections through these vote voting machines without letting us ever have a clue that our votes were stolen. You corrupted your own Democratic Party just as there is a substantial amount of what I call the Bush cartel crime syndicate that stole control of the Republican Party, starting way back with the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy by his own Democratic vice president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, with George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush right there watching it go down. And that was Daddy Bush saying, son, this is how we take out a president. This is a CIA op. So we need to abolish the BLM. We need to abolish the CIA. We need to tear Hoover's name, J. Edgar Hoover's name, off the FBI building. Maybe just get rid of the FBI altogether. Cancel the pensions of the FBI, the CIA. Get rid of them altogether. When you read the Constitution, it says we shall have no standing army for more than two years. And the Congress cannot appropriate a budget for more than two years. Yet we not only have an Army, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard, U.S. Marines. We've got an Army of BLM thugs. We've got an Army FBI thugs, all with their own SWAT teams. All this is against our Constitution. And the Bundys would not have had to suffer had we been reading our Constitution. What don't they teach in our public schools? They do not teach the Constitution. Isn't that sad? They don't teach the Constitution. They may say, here it is, and this is what it means, but they don't ask you to actually study it. They don't ask you to... Look into the lives of the Founding Fathers, what they sacrifice to establish a government under God with liberty and justice for all. So far, the Bundys have been acquitted because 
the crimes of the BLM thugs, and I can't really call them officers. The only few officers that were there are the ones like Wooten that have turned and flipped over and gone to the Bundy side and said, hey, did you know about this video? Did you know about the kill list? Those we could refer to officers. But the others, Daniel P. Love and the majority of the others went quietly along to assassinate, to murder cowboys whose only crime was raising cattle. So you'll have a steak to eat. To raising melons. So you have melons to eat. That should not be a crime. They should be applauded for their diligent hard work in a desert land that I wouldn't want to live in. Absolutely. I've driven up I-15 to St. George through Las Vegas. And I would not want to live there. I would not want to be there in the summer. But this family of Bundys and 52 other ranching families did, and they made their living. Those 52 people, those families, they need to be restored. We need a class action lawsuit by those 52 plus the Bundys against the BLM, against Harry Reid, against Rory Reid, and the ENN Corporation, and Uranium One. All those people, including Hillary, need to pay damages. Well, that's my view, and I thank you. I'm William Wagner. Thank you for watching the second show of 2018, The Bundy Victory, because it was a clear slam dunk victory for the Bundys when the truth finally found its way into that crooked Judge Gloria Navarro's court. Thank God there are still a few decent people in the world that stand up for what's right. Again, I thank you. Write Cleveland Bundy at Bunkerville, Nevada. They know him. Just put Bunkerville, Nevada. You don't need his P.O. box or street address. Just put Cleveland Bundy, Bunkerville, Nevada. Say thank you for standing up. See you. See you.